In section 5.1, we're now going to begin looking at continuous rather than discrete probability distributions. The most important of these is called the normal distribution. Many data sets, including blood pressures for humans, the lifetimes of smartphones, and housing costs are normally distributed. What that means in the most general terms is that it's going to have this kind of shape when graphed. And by this kind of shape, I mean most of the data will be in the middle. So for example, this might be the heights of all U.S. adults. Most people will be close to average. And then on one side, you'll have a few people who are extremely short. And on the other end, you'll have a few people who are extremely tall. But most, again, will be somewhere in the middle. So a normal distribution is just a continuous probability distribution. So heights, for instance, you can be six foot two, six foot three. So that variable is continuous. And we call this curve the normal curve. You'll also sometimes hear it called the bell curve because it looks like a bell. And there are four important properties for you to know about the bell curve. Number one, the mean, median, and mode are all equal. And that's represented by this vertical line right here. You can see down at the bottom, it's been labeled mean. That's the symbol for the mean. And it turns out in a normal curve, the mean and the median and the mode will all be equal. Number two, the curve is going to be bell-shaped and is symmetric about the mean. So in other words, at the mean, we have a line of symmetry for this shape where one half is the mirror image of the other. The total area under the curve will always be equal to one. And between the mean minus one standard deviation, which you can see represented by this line right here, and the mean plus one standard deviation, right here. So, so between these two values, you'll notice uh, the curve here is curving downwards. But then once you get to that first standard deviation beyond the mean, then you'll notice the curve starts turning upwards, both on the left end and on the right. It's the mean and the standard deviation that determine the shape of the normal curve. Specifically, the mean is always going to tell you the location of the line of symmetry because the mean is going to be in the middle of that curve. The standard deviation describes how much the data are spread out. So here you can see in our first example a mean of 3.5. So you'll find the line of symmetry here at 3.5. The standard deviation is 1.5, and we know that because we look for that point where the curve goes from curving downward to curving upward, and that value is 1.5 units away from the mean at 3.5. So in other words, to find this standard deviation, I would take the place where that inflection point, as they call it, occurs, and I'd subtract the mean. Now, in the next graph, we have the same mean, but the standard deviation has now become much smaller. And you can see what that does is it brings the values in closer to the mean. They are less spread out from the mean. And so we get a sharper peak in the data. And again, the mean is still here at 3.5. By finding that inflection point where the curve switches from curving down to curving up, we can locate where that is. And by subtracting these two numbers, we can approximate the standard deviation. Now, uh, for this one, it looks like they said 0 0.7. I mean, honestly, I probably would have guessed closer to one, but that's it's just an approximation, so you don't have to be worried about significant accuracy there. And in the third graph, we have a mean that's now been shifted, so you can see what that does to the curve because our mean is now located here, but it still has the same standard deviation as the last one. So the mean is going to control where that center line falls, and the standard deviation is going to determine how tall and sharp or flat and spread out your curve will be. 
So in example one, which normal curve has a greater mean? If you look at the two curves, A and B, remember the mean is the line of symmetry that's in the middle. So for B, it's approximately here. So the mean for B is 12. The mean for A, the line of symmetry would fall right here. So the mean would be 15. So obviously, A has the larger mean. Which normal curve has a greater standard deviation? We can tell automatically just by looking at these curves that the one that is more spread out will have the bigger standard deviation. So it's going to be B. However, if you wanted to actually estimate numbers for the standard deviation, again, what you would do is find that middle of the curve and look for where it turns from curving down right about here to curving up. So this would represent one standard deviation away. So we could subtract those two numbers and that would give us a standard deviation of approximately three. If we do the same thing for A, even though we know what the right answer is going to be, we would again locate our mean in the middle Look for the spot where the curve goes from curving down to curving up, which I would think would be somewhere around here. Read down to the graph, and now I'd have to estimate um, 15, 16, and 17 have to fall in here. So maybe that's about 16.5. So to find my standard deviation, I would take 16.5 and subtract the mean, and you can see we did get a smaller approximate standard deviation. First basic rule you usually learn about the normal curve is called the empirical rule. And it gives us basic information based on that mean and standard deviation. So if you have a normally distributed variable, about 68% of the data will lie within one standard deviation of the mean. So again, when I said, you know, in terms of adult heights, I said most people fall near the mean. Well, it's specifically, it's 68% from one standard deviation below to one standard deviation above the mean. And notice if you take these two percentages on each half and you add them, 34.13 plus 34.13, you do get 68.26% of the data, or in other words, about 68%. Now, if you expand and you consider from two standard deviations below the mean all the way to two standard deviations above, which is really this distance from here to here, you'll have approximately 95% of the data. So almost everyone will fall somewhere in here. And again, if you want the exact number, you would just total up the four percentages in these four regions. And then finally, oh, this should say three. I'll correct that. About 99.7% of the data will fall within three standard deviations. So that's from here to here. And we usually label that with a little 99.7. So you have very, very small percentages that are more than three standard deviations below the mean or more than three standard deviations above the mean. So here's a sample question. I pulled this from back in section 2.4. In a survey conducted by the National Center for Health Statistics, the sample mean height of women in the US ages 20 to 29 was 64.2 inches with a sample standard deviation of 2.9 inches. Estimate the percent of women whose heights are between 58.4 inches and 64.2 inches. We can do this using the normal curve. To begin this sort of problem, we usually begin by sketching by hand a normal curve and then putting a line of symmetry in the middle to represent the mean. Now, we were told that the mean height 
of women in this age group was 64.2 inches. So you're going to want to label that number below your symbol for the mean. Now you're told that the sample standard deviation is 2.9 inches. So what that means is literally when you move to one standard deviation above the mean, notice mean plus one standard deviation, you would take the mean of 64.2 and literally just add one standard deviation. So add 2.9 onto 64.2. That's going to give you 67.1 to be a height that corresponds to being one standard deviation above the mean. Now, to label the next standard deviation, you would again just add on another standard deviation so that you've added on two to the original mean. So take 67.1, add 2.9, and you are now at 70 inches. We can go one standard deviation further, and I'm at 72.9 inches. Now you'll want to do the same thing going backwards. These are all going to represent heights that are above average for women in this age group. We should also label the ones that are below average. And you can see right here how we're going to do that. We're going to take the mean and subtract a standard deviation. So now we're starting at the mean but we're going backwards and subtracting 2.9 as we do that. So if you do 64.2, take away 2.9, you get 61.3, subtract another standard deviation. So 61.3, now I'm going to take away 2.9, and I get 58.4, and subtract one more 2.9, and I get 55.5. So the first step in answering a question using the empirical rule is to actually apply the numbers to the number line. Here's the mean, add the standard deviation as you move to the right, subtract it as you move to the left. Now I want to estimate the percent of women whose heights are between 58.4 inches and 64.2. Here's 58.4. Here is 64.2. So I'm looking to know the percent of women in this population that are going to fall between these two. And I can figure that out because of my empirical rule. So looking back above, we're going to use the empirical rule values. We're going to use 68% within one standard deviation, 95% within two, and 99.7% within three. So what I'm going to do is I know 68% represents being all the way from one standard deviation below the mean to one above. So I'm gonna split that into two pieces. If you do 68 divided by two, you know that there are 34% of the population that are one standard deviation above and 34% that are one standard deviation below. Now what I need is to know what percentage would be in this next section. Well, I'm gonna take the 95% and I'm gonna divide that by two, giving me 47.5%. So that tells me that from here all the way out to here, in this total distance, I'm supposed to have 95%. By dividing it in two, I found half of that. And I know then from the mean out to the second standard deviation below, there's going to be 47%. 0.5% of the data. And that corresponds to all of my blue shaded region, so that's going to be my answer. It turns out that we can get a lot more specific and improve our accuracy beyond just the basic empirical rule. The empirical rule is 
good for giving you approximations for these answers, but if you want the real exact answer, we're going to see how to do that next.